Well, we thank God for this new day that He has given us, and uh, we thank God for being able to be here in, in His house of worship. Um, I don't see any birthday gifts, so I would have just assumed that there were no birthdays this past week. No? Okay. Well, I'm just uh, substituting for Sister Carol today. Um, she was supposed to be in Chicago, and the plan was that I was supposed to take care of the class while she was out. So here I am, being able, taking care of the class as well as I can. Um, but before we get into the lesson, we're just going to go ahead and as Sister Carol does usually uh, go over some of the questions that we had for the lesson. Um, and you all, of course, are going to have the answers for us, right? Yes? All right. All right. So first question would be, did Joshua tell the Israelites that God gave them cities in which to live that they did not build? So cities that they did not build, did Joshua... Uh, tell the people of Israel that that's, they were going to have those cities. It's a yes or no question. The answer is yes. no. Yes. Is it no? Yes. 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 Brother Ignacio, are you sure, brother? Okay, so he did tell them that. All right. What a blessing that God will prepare things for us that we did not even have to fight for. And that is a reality in our lives. You know, if we look at our lives and we're able to look back and we're able to see the things that we enjoy, so many things that we enjoy that, um, that we did not even have to build, that we did not even have to fight for, but God has given it to us. And since this is Memorial Weekend, Memorial Day weekend, I think about the fact of so many who have gone to war for this the liberty and the freedoms that we cherish so much today and we are the ones that are enjoying it so it's a blessing from God as well when we think about that and look at our lives it's more than just being able to look this at this in a lesson but being able to look at our own lives and see the things that we can enjoy because God and his great goodness has has given him to us second question which God did Joshua say he was going to serve which of the many gods of the land did Joshua say he was going to serve? Does anyone know? Yes, Alexander. God. The Lord God, right? Yes. Okay, you have a different answer? The Lord. the Lord, okay. So we all agreed that it was going to be the Lord God that he was going to serve. Joshua did not say, now we, this is an ABC question, so here are the answers. Did He did not say, God is jealous, God is holy, God has done good to the Israelites, or God will overlook service to foreign gods. What? What was it that God... He didn't say what? Overlook the service. So God was not going to overlook him. First of all, because he is a jealous God. He is, he is the only one. He wants his, uh, our undivided attention and devotion. And he is a holy God. So idolatry is not holy, right? It is perverse and corrupt because we are putting other things before God. And uh, God has done good to the Israelites, but God will not overlook his service to foreign gods. Okay, next question. What was the purpose of the stone that Joshua set up at Shechem? Brother Anthony. That Brother Anthony. What was the purpose of the stone that Joshua set up on Shechem? <laughs> It was a memorial. Are you sure? Not too sure, Sister Floor. It was a witness. It was a witness what they had said. A witness to what they had said. Okay. So it was a memorial. A witness. How many of you read the lesson? The chapter, rather. Okay. So then you would know that that was one of the main things that that stood out. Okay. Joshua was how old? in Joshua 24, 29. How old was Joshua? For those of you who read the lesson, sister, he was 110 years old. And what happened to him at 110? He died. He what? He died. He died. <laughs> and where did they bury him? Where? In Canaan. Well, specifically? Oh. Does anyone know I'm being... We're specific with that question. Does anybody know where they buried him? What was that? I cannot hear you. Okay, 
There was a there was a mountain that was given to him as an inheritance. What is the name of that mountain? Ephraim. So they buried him in Mount Ephraim, and specifically uh, in Timasura. And I wasn't expecting you all to know that answer. Okay. So um, also, Eleazar, Eleazar, or however you pronounce his name. What happened to him in chapter twenty-four? He also yeah, died. He also died. And where did they bury him? Also there. Where? In the same mountain, in the same place. You think so? Are you sure? <laughs> Remember, they have different different inheritance, and so they w it would not be the same. So, does anyone know? I know you're referencing your Bibles now, Sister T. Sister Rose. What was that, Sister? You know what? And uh, it's my fault because I, I'm talking. To, I'm ask, I'm looking at Joseph's answer, and I'm talking to you about El Elisa. So good, sister. Good. You caught up. So where do they bury Joseph? Then? In the same mountain? No. They buried him in Shechem. Shechem. Okay, so Joseph was buried in Shechem, right? Do you all agree? Okay. All right, so uh, yes or no again. Did the Israelites serve God as long as the elders who knew Joshua lived? Yes. Yes, okay. So they served God as long as Joshua and the elders who um, survived Joshua. Where were the bones of Joseph buried? I already gave you that answer, didn't I? <laughs> and Shisha. All right. Okay. So we are talking this, this morning about there was a, a fa farewell message that Joshua was delivering to the people of Israel. This whole chapter has to do with the fact that he knew this was it for him and he was going to give he was addressing them it was his farewell address okay and he was basically making them accountable for what was going what decisions they were going to make after his passing so he was making sure that um that they would realize that they needed to make a decision and before we go there, I want us to turn to Joshua 17, 13, actually verse 12 and 13, and somebody who would read that for me, I would greatly appreciate it. Because this here, Joshua 17, 12 and 13, keeping in mind that he, this was his farewell address, and we go back to chapter 17, and there's something that happens here. And you tell me what that is. Who would like to read it? Sister Grant. Loud and clear, Sister. Yet the children of Manasseh went up to the city. Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in the land. Yet it came to pass, when the children of Israel were wax and strong, that they put the Canaanites to tribute but did not utterly drive them out. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry, go. you can finish reading. Did you say 12 and 13? 12 and 13. Okay, that's it. Okay. Two small verses here, but there's something of great importance here. And you, you tell me what is wrong with this picture. I'm, I'm not going to tell you, I'll elaborate, but I want you to tell me with what we just read and the understanding that we have of what was supposed to happen. Tell me, Brother Carlos, since you raised your hand, what's wrong with this picture? I can't hear. They were supposed to utterly switch them out of the land because of their corrupted influence and the different practices that they would that they used to do. And that would have been a corruptive element in their, in their society. Of course, the Messiah was going to come from them, so uh, that was going to be a challenge. And, um, they would have been turned to other gods uh, further down the line, as we saw. So that was the first mistake. The second, I think, was that there was a financial benefit for them. They thought that God could. They didn't. 
they they benefited financially from that. They, they didn't have to really worry about that. God was going to take care of many of them. Right. Okay, anyone else? Anybody else would like to ask what Brother Carlos said? Sister Tico, which is not Sister Tico, it's Brother Tico. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> No, oh, brother? Okay, then sister? Um, well, he said a lot. Like, we talked about it in his other classes, how they, they were just lazy and complacent. And they didn't, know, they didn't know what they were supposed to do to drive their enemies out. So little by little, they started to get mixed up with them and marrying their children and giving their children to their children to marry. And it ended up affecting them. Okay. And that is all true. Um, but let's point out a couple of things here. The, the sentence starts with yet. Because here if we look at the chapter, there is a distribution of the lots of land that we're going to be giving over to the tribes. Everybody with me? So, but, there's a yet, there's a but there. And, and it basically says that Manasseh didn't do what they were supposed to do. Now, we look at the other tribes and supposedly they were, uh, had done or were doing what they were supposed to do, but when we get to Manasseh, there's a but. And I think about our own selves, if we apply this to our own selves, that we get to see what's going on, and then when it comes to us, there can't be a but. There can't be a get. If the standard has been set up here, the things are supposed to be up here, then, then how can we have a yet? or a but in our lives. None of us want to be in the position that they would say, well, so and so and so and so and so and so, yet Brother Miguel, okay, or you can put your name there, you know, failed to do this. Now I want you to realize that the inhabitants of the city, they, they were dwelling in Canaan, could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities. Manasseh was not able to drive them out. Could you tell me why? Why weren't they able to drive them out? Sister Brent. It, it says here in Spanish, and I just compared it to what it says in English, it, said, it says um, that they were strong. They were strong, you know. Suficiente. In verse 12, in verse 12. Oh. Why, why, why did they not they drive them out? Because they persisted. The Canaanites persisted. The Canaanites persisted. And when, yes, brother. It couldn't be maybe because Manassas were divided in two, 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 they went to two different areas. Okay. And maybe that's why they didn't have enough. But what was the commandment was that you have to drive them out, you have to destroy them. So, yes, you know, they were divided. Yes, the, the enemy persisted. So bringing that to us, don't we have an enemy that, pers that is persistent? Isn't he persistent? So just because there is a resistance, the enemy persists, and in this case, the enemy was persisting, and they're saying, we have a stronghold here, we have a fortress here, and you are not going to drive us out. Basically saying, I don't care what your God has said, but we are holding on to this land, and we're not letting you go. Yes. But they were also, they were weak. They didn't, like it says, they got stronger. They, so I mean that in the beginning they were weak. So they didn't fortify their weaknesses to, to be able to drive them out. And then the enemy persisted, so then that's what they Well, getting ahead of myself here, shame on them. Okay, because if you look at the fact that the verse is telling, giving us the facts that they have become strong. So you're telling me that they have become strong, yet they settled to be able to live with the enemy there. Mm -hmm. So it was not an issue anymore. And they were strong in the beginning, but they became even stronger, and yet they settled. And it goes back to the message that Sister Carol brought not long ago regarding complacency. They had everything on their side to be able to drive out the enemy, yet they chose to do something different than God told them to do, and that was to dwell with them. And let me tell you something Sister Carol said in her message, when she brought the message. She says, you fight until you get the victory. You do whatever you need to do to be able to get the victory. 
you do not give in because you feel all of this in your body. You do not give in because there's, there's this overwhelming wave that is coming against you like a tsunami. You persist. And as long as the enemy persists, then you have to persist. And you have to build a stronghold. And you have to stand your ground. And you have to go out through the enemy and be able to clear it out. You can't get used to just living with certain things in your lives. We cannot get used to that because they're going to come and bite you at the end. Brother T. <laughs> tell them that they were he wasn't going to drive them out all at once but it was their responsibility to fulfill God's purpose and God's plan for the people of Israel and they were supposed to utterly like it says in verse 13 at the end utterly drive them out because God was going to go ahead and say okay you go ahead through my might and through my power you go ahead and do what you need to do if not you know they were going to stay in the land and this was definitely not God's plan for them to stay in the land. And so they, they failed. And just like in our own lives, and we covered this in the past, but we see here that there's complacency. And we cannot have complacency. We can't overcome everything that we have to face in life in one day. Right? Our lives have stages. We have different seasons that we go through and different experiences. But as those experiences come, God wants us to drive the enemy out and not let him gain any ground in our lives. So now, let's take a look at a contrast to complacency in Philemon chapter 21. Philemon verse 21. There's only one chapter. 21. This is the contrast to complacency. And someone who would like to read it loud and clear. Anyone have it? You're in Spanish? English? Having confidence in thy obedience. Philemon 21. Brother, what was that? Having confidence in thy obedience. I wrote unto thee, knowing that you would also do more than I say. Okay. This, did everybody read that verse 21? I want to make sure everybody reads it. Read it. Because this is a contrast to complacency. It would be the opposite. Here God tells the people of Israel, you need to drive these people utterly out. It is to be completely taken out of there. You have become strong. You have the ability to be able to do it. You have the power in my name to be able to drive the enemy out. Yet you did go ahead and you, you, you brought them subject unto you and you made them pay taxes and they were slaves to you. But what was it that I told you to do? I told you to drive them out. Here they had all the resources and yet they didn't. So here in verse 21 in Philemon, in Philemon, we see, what do we see? Someone tell me. Someone tell me, please. Interact here with me. 
Does everybody see that? What Sister Janet is saying? Could you let them know? Right, and could you read the verse to them? Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. So having confidence in your obedience. Let's look at our own selves. Is there, can, can the pastor have confidence in our obedience? Or when the pastor counsels us and we receive counseling from the ministry that they really don't know if you're going to heed counsel? Remember what, what we talked about last week? That their downfall was the fact that they did not take at heart what God was telling them. They did not take heed to what was God telling them. And, and it, it said there that they did not, um, I can't remember exactly, but they did not fully heed or fully pay attention to what God was telling them. But here you have someone that that is being written to and they're saying, but I have confidence in your obedience. I have confidence because I have seen how obedient you have been. I have confidence because I know that you have not been complacent and taken it easy and, and just slapped off and become sloppy and careless. But I have confidence because of what I've seen. I know, I know that you're not just going to do what I said for you to do but you're going to take it even further. You're gonna take it beyond what I said. You're gonna make sure that it's done and that every T is crossed and that every I is dotted. And we have to look at ourselves, myself included. Can someone say that about us? Can our pastor say that about us? Can he say that about me? You know, that when you're counseled, when we hear a message that is preached, when we hear the trumpet sound, when we hear the, the uh, admonition, are we going to take it at heart? We're going to be, that he's going to be able to be confident that he's going to be able to have a congregation that's going to take that at heart and take it even to the next level. Or are we going to find loopholes? Know what loopholes are? Loopholes are, oh, well, he said this, but he didn't mean this. So it's like going under the radar type of thing. Just finding those little loopholes, finding, making things exceptions. Everything is an exception. Obviously, there are exceptions to certain rules, but everything cannot be an exception. So making sure that there is no complacency in our lives is that we have a heart that takes heed to what God says. And we put into practice, we pay attention to what is being taught to us, that we'll be able to take it even to the next level. And that, that that testimony will shine, and that testimony will be seen that you're a brother, you're a sister, I'm a brother who takes things at heart, and we do not let the Word of God just fall to the ground. Okay? Um, moving on from there, going back to his farewell address, there's some key verses here that I wanted to touch upon before we, we finish. Um, going to back to Joshua chapter 24. Um, just a little emphasis on the fact there that it says that I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities which ye built not, and ye dwell in them, are the vineyards, of the olive yards, yards which ye planted not, do ye eat. Once again, we see here God's goodness, the fact that God blessed him so much and gave him a land of that flowed with milk and honey, and it was prepared all for them. The vineyards were already there. They didn't have to plant the vineyards and wait for those olives to come out and for those grapes to come out. They didn't have to go in there and get all exhausted after fighting and, and have to start building the walls and building the cities and building their houses and, and just plowing the land. All of that was given to them. They were given all of that to them. And it's no wonder in verse 15 that Joshua then says, after all this that God has done for you, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. After everything that God has done for us and given us. Remember that He is the one that fights our battles. He is the one that conquers for us. He is the one that has not dealt with us according to our sins, just like the Word of God says. He has given us so much that we have not even labored for, 
that we are not worthy of, that we don't deserve, yet God in His goodness has wanted to bestow upon our lives His blessings and all these things that we have. So then how, how come, you know, Joshua then says, if it seems evil after all of this, if it looks like it's evil, like it's a bad thing, is it an evil thing, you know, just to serve God, would you say it's evil? Would you say it's bad? I think it doesn't make any sense, right? That there, you would have, actually even have to compare that, you know, you would have to say, well, if it seems bad to you, after God delivering them out of Egypt, God bringing them through the wilderness, God parting the Red Sea, God feeding them with manna when they were out in the wilderness, God fighting their wars and anybody rose up against them, that they were able to fight and they were able to overcome how could a bunch of slaves know how to fight? How could a bunch of slaves know how to conquer? It is God in them, God, what God did for them, they were able to do this. And yet it seems like ridiculous that he would say this. And sometimes what we may say, you know, may seem kind of ridiculous, but you know, maybe it just opens up our eyes and opens up our, our heart and allows us to see things that we don't see before. Because obviously, if I stand in here and I tell you it's a bad thing to serve God, you're going to obviously tell me, why are you even saying that? Because I know that, that it wouldn't be a bad thing to serve God. Yes. That's an example of the confusion that the devil can sow in your mind that you get to that point where you start seeing serving God as a bad thing and as a, you know, as a hard thing, not as the beautiful thing that it is. So I think that just comes with it. Can you all hear him? They can't hear you. You're going to have to stand up and tell us. <laughs> I was just saying that I think that's a good example of how the devil can sow confusion in your mind that you start seeing the negative act, you start seeing God serving God as a, as a hard thing, as a bad thing, not as a beautiful thing. So, and you see that the Israelites are, they, they're so confused and always, they're kind of backward. And I think that's a perfect example of what the devil can do to our minds if we allow him to. Yeah, um, I really don't like to hear people saying, that's my own personal opinion, that to live for God is a hard thing to do. And it's not. To me, it's absurd for anybody to ever say such a thing. And it's a lie of the devil. And it's a, 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 we should never listen to any thought that will come to our minds to tell us that it's an evil and bad thing to be able to serve God. Because it is the devil who is the harsh and hard taskmaster who just wants to destroy us and kill us. And just because we face our little trials and our little battles and then we have the audacity to stand and say, oh, it's a hard thing to serve God. It's too hard for me as a young person. It's too hard for me to have a wife and have children and still think about God. No, it is not. God has been so good to us that how could anyone ever say that this life is a rough life? No, it's not. And I hope that none of us would ever think such a thing because in the midst of the battles, in the midst of the trials, we have God who is with us and in us. And He's the one that makes it sweet when the battle gets hard. He's the one that, that gives us the, 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 the vision to be able to see things in a different way and not allow just everything to just tumble down on ourselves to destroy us. So we have to always remember that. And then He says, choose you this day who you will serve, whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood or the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So in other words, he's saying, don't know what you're going to do. I don't know what you're going to do with all that you already know about God and about these, these false gods. But for me, in my house, he's just basically washing his hands. He's basically saying, you know, your blood is not on my hands. I've done everything that I've needed to do. Now it's up to you. So, but as far as I'm concerned, regardless of what you're going to do, I and my house, me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And it says in verse 20, because they go on and then they say that, they're going to serve God. In the verse 20, 20, he says, If ye forsake the Lord, he warns them once again. If ye forsake the Lord, and the same warning is for us, and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt, and consume you after that he had done you good. 
We can't expect anything but the judgments of God after we have served God and after we have experienced the goodness and the favor of God in our lives. We cannot expect anything else but the judgment of God in our life if we turn away from Him. Um, strange gods. If any of us are going to bow down before an idol, we would never think of bowing down before an idol, would we? Going ahead and calling a coconut our God. Getting that same coconut and making it look nice and pretty, we wouldn't bow down before it and still call it our God. But what are some of the strange gods that want to take place in our life? That want to <coughs> want us to regard them as opposed to regarding God the way we should. What would some of those strange gods be? Yes, Alexander. Relationships. Very good one. Because some people could make their gods other people, their peers, like in school, at work, or being able to make sure that I'm in cahoots with you, so I'll compromise or my relationship with God. What else would be a strange God, Sister Floor? Your job, brother, Sister Jen. Mine. Money. I think that that is one of the, the, and I'm not saying necessarily money, but when I think about money, I think about materialism. And that is what we have been hearing. It's one of the big things that we face in our society, that everything, especially in the United States, is kind of, let me have all my toys, and let me consume, 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 and be entertained by all of this thing, and the more I have, the better things are with me. So it's all that materialism. It's a strange God. It's strange because how can you make materialism something that you can live for and worship? And you look at the word strange, it's abnormal. It's not the normal thing. It is not the right thing to do. It is not uh, rational or reasonable that we will go after a strange God such as materialism or our peers or our jobs. And you were going to say something. The same thing, materialism. Yes. Oh, and that's a very good one. You were going to say something? No, no, no. Okay. I was going to fix this. Self. <laughs> Not just materialism, but serving our own selves. Selfishness. Greed. That we would only think about ourselves. And we could go to James 1.27 regarding that. Somebody please look it up. James 1.27. <laughs> Sister Jenny, you have it, right? You have it? Okay. Your religion and undefiled. What is it? Your religion. Your religion. And undefiled before God and the Father. And undefiled before God and the Father. Is this to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So to keep yourself unspotted from the world, but there is something there that they make emphasis on, and that is what, Sister Floor, again? Pure religion and undefiled before God. No, but something about comforting. Oh, to visit the fatherless and widows. Okay, so there, in reference to what Brother Anthony was saying about serving our own selves, there it's telling us what pure religion is which will we live on spotted, holy lines, but it doesn't stop there. It's being able to comfort and console those. It says they're the widows, and it says those who are afflicted. So it's not just about thinking about our own selves. That would be another strange God, that as the body of Christ, we would just be thinking about ourselves instead of about reaching out to those who need us. And trust me, we need each other, and there's always somebody who, who will need us. Um, going down to verse 25, five minutes, I have five minutes, we have five minutes. So in verse 25, so Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shisha. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone, a huge stone, and he set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. He set up this huge stone by God's sanctuary. And it was supposed to be, as we said in the beginning, a witness between them and God with what just happened here. He told them, you know what? Choose you this day what you're going to do. I'm going to serve God regardless of what you said or you say or what your choice is, he said to them. 
And they responded. And they said, oh no, we're going to serve God and we're going to be faithful to God. So what did he do? He made them accountable by build, putting that huge stone by the sanctuary. So every time they would pass by that sanctuary, every time they would have to go to the sanctuary because that was the place where they were going to worship and where the Ark of God would be at, they would remember their words that they were going to serve God. And that monument would stand there to be able, not just for them, but so they can pass it on to their children and their children's children and those children pass it on to their children. When someone would ask, what is that big stone by the sanctuary? What do you think that we're supposed to say? Oh, that's just an ornament we put there just for the, uh, make the temple or the sanctuary look good and nice. You know, a lot of them may have forgotten after the years went by, but that wasn't supposed to be forgotten. It was supposed to serve as a monument after the years went by that they were going to serve God. And it reminds me of, and Sister Carol, I guess, referenced this when she brought a lesson. And I don't know how many of you still have your little, your stones. How many of you still have the stones that Sister Carol gave out? Okay. And it was based on that. That would be a memorial. A memorial so that she made it, she made it not just something that she was saying like I'm doing this morning, but she literally gave us something tangible that we could remember. Just like the egg that Sister Marisa gave us. How many of you still have your eggs? Okay. So the egg is a symbol of what we're supposed to do with our money. That little rock that she gave us is to remind us what, as a memorial, what our commitment is to God. That, that choosing, that decision that we make. You know, they were supposed to choose that day who they were going to serve. And we have to choose every day of our lives. We choose that day that we repented of our sins and we turn our lives over to God. But this is a daily thing. A daily thing that we would never forget the commitment that we made to God, that we said we're going to serve you, that we're going to honor you, okay? We cannot forget that. And this is what that stone was supposed to be used for, and that's why that little rock that Sister Carol gave us was something tangible that we could hold on and remember that message and remember that we would not move from, from God. And he says here in verse 27, And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be witness unto you. And um, I, um, the night that Nati passed away, and I'm just going to say this, and I'm going to try to say it, but she passed away, and I was in her room with her, and she, I told her, Oh, you have the stone. I mentioned something about the stone. And she turned around just with such confidence and she said, yes, that's my monument, that's my memorial. She kept that little stone on her nightstand every day and every night. It was a point of reference to her about her commitment for God. Amen. And excuse me for the tears, but it's just the fact, saints, that it's some, a young person can take things at heart like that Amen. and to literally use what is given to them, the tools that we have, then how can we fail God in any way? We need to use whatever we need to use in our lives to be able to remember that no matter what happens, we will hold on to God and that we will not forget what God has done for us. That we will not forget what we have told God in that altar so many times that God has dealt with us. And we go to the altar and we make promises and we make vows and we say, Lord, we're going to be different. We're going to do things differently. And yet we go back to the same slop and we go back to the same carelessness and we don't do things the way we're supposed to do it because we've all been guilty of it, even myself. But something like this, it is to remind us, this witness, it is to remind us of what God has done for us. And we, we, we go to the altar and we make commitments and we want God to change us. We cannot forget those things. And, and the last thing that I just wanted to mention is that as long as they had Joshua and as long as they had the elders that outlived Joshua, they, they served God. But saints, we have to keep this alive. Even when others pass, 
that were our leaders and were the ones who showed us the word of God, we have to remember and take at heart what we have been taught. And we have to keep that alive, that it would not happen like it happened to the Israelites. That it just, when the generations pass and the generations pass, it was all lost, it was all gone. And they ended up to be captives instead of being the ones to overcome and prevail. So let us keep alive in us all the things that we know and that we have learned through our, our ministry here. Okay? God bless each one of you.